Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Kevin McCracken. I'm the executive director of The Last Mile. Before we get started tonight, we're going to show a short video about one of our graduates. And I want to say that I've been working in fair chance employment and criminal justice reform for almost 25 years, and rarely have I seen somebody with such character and seen such a transformation and change in somebody's life. I'm really excited. We're premiering this film tonight. It's going to be available tomorrow, um, but you're going to be the first to see it. Uh, this woman is working now for the Pacers, which was a relationship we pursued for a long time and is a perfect example of how fair chance employment should and could work. So I'm going to introduce Billy and you'll see her video. So thanks. Hello. You have a collect call from an Indiana Department of Corrections facility. Hey, honey, what are you doing? Oh, chilling with Zane. Just got back from church. Oh, nice. Had a conversation with my kids that I didn't want to have. I was choosing to stay in prison for another year, and I had already chose so many different things over them. That was a rough time. Yeah. I was raised around a lot of drug use and alcohol. Uh, by 15, I was a full-blown alcoholic. My addiction was so bad. I don't know how I kept a job. I don't know how I owned a home for 16 years, uh, how I took care of my kids and, and, and they thrived. I, I still look back on that today and I'm like, I don't know how you maintained, but I did until I didn't. What I was involved in was serious. I mean, a girl died. I felt so bad for the life that you could never bring back. It's hard. I did not want to leave prison the same way I came in. I got sober and I was able to build an amazing relationship with God. I was uh, going to get out of prison early and just didn't feel like my prison time was done yet. We opened the first coding class in a U.S. prison. And since then, um, you know, we've had tremendous success and sort of blew the ceiling off what people thought was possible. first day, I was just like, there's no way I'm going to be able to complete this class. One of the hardest things I've ever done in my entire life. But I also knew that I'd given up a lot to sit in that chair. Billy had that commitment that I think is unparalleled. The fact that someone would stay in prison to finish this program because they believe. I just took a post-it note and I wrote on it, quitting is not an option, and I stuck it on my monitor. Leading up to the end of the class was, it was bittersweet. I loved being in that classroom, and I knew it was about to be over, but then it was like, I get to go home. Like, and I just accomplished one of the hardest things I've ever done in my entire life. Getting out of prison was not easy. I thought it would be a lot easier. The barriers to success are pretty significant. You can't get housing if you have a criminal record. You can't get jobs. I put in so many applications and no one was giving me a chance. That was extremely overwhelming. You know, I just, I wasn't going to give up. We heard all the time in the classroom like what the last mile does, what they do for you when you get out. Their reentry program is, there are no words for how phenomenal it is. So Molly, the reentry coordinator, you know, I met with Molly every week, sometimes twice a week. I would call her crying when I was overwhelmed. Hello. Hey, Billy, it's Molly. How are you? We had our meetings every week, and she was like, hey, do you want to go work for the Pacers? I was like, whatever. <laughs> Well, Steve Simon is a good friend, and he became a, an advocate early on. You know, we're always thinking, can we be involved to tell a story of, 
you know, how much we've gotten out of working with The Last Mile and, and you know, how we want to grow that program. Could we get to the point where the Pacers hire someone? He's observed the success we've had over the years and saying, okay, we're ready now. And hopefully the Pacers set an example of what is possible for other teams to really follow and impact their communities. It's just unbelievable. I, I pull into the parking garage and almost every morning I tear up because I cannot believe I'm going to work for that organization. Someone who's paid their debt to society should be welcomed back if they've gone down that positive path. We show that if we operate rehabilitation the right way, you have people coming out productive, not going back to prison. Just the success of one person has a huge downstream effect on public safety and generational incarceration. The idea of collectively society figuring out a way to you know, love them and forgive them and have them reach their full potential, that's like obvious. I mean, it's life changing. I mean, I'm experiencing that right now. I have worked so hard, and I'm gonna keep going. For my family, for those I hurt, for those that need a fair chance, like the people sitting in the last mile seats right now. People can change and give them a chance. Give them a chance. Hello and welcome to tonight's Commonwealth Club World Affairs Program. My name is Ladaris Cordell. I'm a retired California Superior Court judge and author of Her Honor, My Life on the Bench, What Works, What's Broken, and How to Change It. And I'm the moderator for this evening's program. Yesterday, the Columbia University Press published excessive punishment, how the justice system creates mass incarceration. It's a book of essays that unpacks why our criminal legal system is so punitive. Excessive punishment contains 38 essays by 45 contributors, practitioners, activists, academics, and thought leaders who contributed their critical voices to highlighting the harms of the status quo and providing valuable insight into how we can move toward a criminal legal system that is smaller, more effective, and more humane. So thank you for joining us for this very important discussion. It is noteworthy that we are fewer than 20 miles from San Quentin Prison Complex, where the California Department of Corrections recently released a 150-page independent report that is a blueprint for reimagining that facility as a place of actual rehabilitation. As a former California Superior Court judge, I presided over cases in a criminal legal system where punishment was almost exclusively my only sentencing option. Indeed, I chose to leave the bench rather than continue to participate in an overly punitive system that has filled our prisons with disproportionate numbers of black and brown people. While some of the essays in this book reveal many of the injustices endured by those who are ensnared in a punitive legal system, there are essays that provide meaningful ways to peel back the layers of punitiveness to create a truly criminal justice system in America. With this wonderful panel, we're going to explore it all. Each one of these individuals brings a unique perspective about excessive punishment. I'm just going to briefly introduce them to you. 
And when I call their names, so they raise their hand a little so we know who we're talking about. L.B. Eisen is Senior Director of the Justice Program at the Brennan Center for Justice, where L.B. leads the organization's work to end mass incarceration. L.B. is a former prosecutor who also worked as a journalist and is the author of Inside Private Prisons, An American Dilemma in the Age of Mass Incarceration. Welcome, LB. Kevin McCracken is the executive director at The Last Mile. Kevin has been an advocate of fair chance employment for 23 years and a volunteer in San Quentin State Prison for eight years. He is also the co-founder of Social Imprints, one of the most successful social enterprises in the country. Michael Mendoza is the former director of advocacy at the Anti-Recidivism Coalition. Michael was incarcerated as an adult at the age of 15 when he received a 15 year to life sentence. Michael earned his release in 2014 after serving close to 18 years. Kevin Oliver is the it Ken, excuse me, Ken Oliver is the executive director at Checker.org and vice president of corporate social responsibility at Checker. We're going to hear from him about the good work of Checker. In 1996, Ken was sentenced to 52 years to life under California's three strikes law for joyriding as a passenger in a stolen car. Ken spent close to 24 years in prison, eight of them in solitary confinement for reading a book by a former Black Panther Party member. With the support of Stanford University and a corporate law firm, Meyer Brown, Ken won a civil rights lawsuit against the state, resulting in a monetary settlement and his release from prison in 2019. Thank you all for being here. All right, so um, I encourage you, if you have questions as we go along, to write them on the cards. These are fascinating individuals, and we want to know what they have to say about all of this. So I'm going to start uh, with LB. Um, the, essays, the essays in your book, in this book, cover a lot of ground, from how young people of color are mistreated in the legal system to the inhumane conditions of confinement, and there's a whole lot more. So a couple of questions here. What was your purpose in putting this book together? I mean, you didn't write it. You pulled together all of these essays. And I, do you have an essay yourself, at least the intro, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And so that's one, the purpose. And what do you hope to achieve with these essays? And a third question, I know this is complex here. <laughs> um, third is, how did you choose the essay contributors? Said like any good lawyer, a three-part question. There you go. Um, <laughs> So thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you so much, uh, Judge Cordell, for moderating. So in terms of the purpose of the book, um, this was a, a multi-year project. And the essays really, if you sit down and read them in one sitting, which some people have done, they explain how we as a country enacted such an incredibly overly punitive criminal legal system. And to your point, there are some seeds of change in these essays. Um, you know, the goal was to convince policymakers, decision makers, that we have to reimagine our justice system. You know, our country struggles with an incredibly deep-rooted impulse to punish in ways that are wildly disproportionate to the harm that was originally caused. And you know, to sort of concretize what I mean when I say that, we have incredibly lengthy prison sentences in this country. We have life without parole. You know, there are over 200,000 people right now as we have this conversation who are serving life without parole sentences. We trap people 
individuals, their families in a lifetime of criminal justice debt. The debt is so overwhelming that some people can never pay it off. Um, you know, one of the essays in this book highlights the more than 40,000, that's, that's not a misstatement, 40,000 rules, laws, regulations that make it almost impossible to rejoin communities after incarceration or to find a job or housing or vote if you've been convicted and might not even have served a night in jail or prison. So it's more punishment after the incarceration punishment. Yes, and, and we're How an long? outlier. And I think that's what this book highlights. When you look at the United States compared with other democratic countries and, and you tell policymakers what our system of punishment looks like, they're flabbergasted. You know, there's a great book by, um, you know, a, a wonderful book by Robert, the late Robert Ferguson, who was a professor at Columbia, Univer Columbia University, who writes about there's, you know, sometimes a lot of procedure in the court system, in the sort of preliminary part of being involved in the justice system. And then judges sentence people to prison, and they have no idea what is happening once someone is behind bars. And there's this bifurcated system in this country, and, and there really is endless punishment. I worked very closely with uh, Columbia University um, sociologists Bruce Western and um, Jeremy Travis, who's at the now at the Columbia University Justice Lab, in fashioning some of the themes of this book and thinking through essays. And they really urged me to highlight and ask the contributors to focus on the lack of guardrails that exist in the criminal legal system. And that concept really drove me as I was asking people to contribute and, and editing the essays. It's the sense that we've lost any commitment to proportionality when we erect more and more barriers to reentry. It's this sense that We've set up a system where we have 4,400 more than actually prisons and jails in this country, and we really have no idea what's happening inside these facilities. There are no guardrails against what many people in the field now call punitive excess, which is this idea that it's not just punishment, it's excess punishment. Um, and in terms of getting to the second part of your three-part question, um, I truly do hope that voters, um, the broader public, read these essays and realize that we can't respond to harm and crime and every increase in crime that, you know, crime will increase, crime will decrease. That's what's always happened in the history of the United States. And we can't respond with harsher and more punitive policies. We know these policies don't create public safety. They simply harm people and individuals and our broader communities. Um, you know, the Brennan Center where I work believes if you don't win in the court of public opinion, if you can't change hearts and minds in the court of public opinion, you're not going to be able to change policy and legislation. And that's why I think this book is so important. I, th I think one of the best ways of getting it out is this platform, the Commonwealth Club and just getting reaching thousands and thousands of people and hopefully those who maybe are not you know the you're not just those preaching to the choir but those who've never really thought about it hopefully they'll read this and and what i also liked about these essays they're not real long and i know that that was part of your criteria as well so i mean it just isn't a drudgery to read these at all in fact it's just it was amazing to read these and how much god can uh, got contained in, in such really short essays. But go ahead. Well, and these essays are coming out in 2024, which everyone in this room, everyone listening, knows is an election year. Um, at the local us. level, at yeah. the state level, at the federal level, crime has always been a wedge issue in politics, yes. and it will continue to be a wedge issue in politics. And we're seeing state after state pass regressive policies, policies that are not ultimately going to create public safety. We're seeing states, um, you know, increasing the length of sentences 
We're seeing states incarcerate more people. We're seeing states um, really turning their back right now. Um, some states on criminal justice reform, and so it's, it's pivotal that the broader public understands the research and the evidence that indicates mass incarceration does not create public safety. We have two million people behind bars in this country. We have more than four million people on probation and parole. We have 70 million people with a criminal record. We incarcerate more people in the United States than any country on this planet. And we know, we have decades of research and evidence that mass incarceration does not make us safer. Long sentences do not make us safer. And we have to use this incredible moment to elect policymakers, decision makers, who understand that there are so many other ways to reduce crime other than overlying on arrest and incarceration. And I'm happy to talk about yeah. what those look like right. a little bit later. And I do want to remind people, you're hearing this from a former prosecutor. So, and that's important. I mean, this is someone who has been on the other side of this and is now advocating and saying this is change that has to happen to make all of us safer. Um, one last quick question then, my third was, how did you pick your contributors? Mm -hmm. So some of the contributors in this book um, were people who I had either worked with before or who um, had a really important story to tell. And you know, as Judge Cordell noted, there are a very diverse group of contributors. Um, you know, they had very different stories. So some were researchers, experts, some were people who had experienced incarceration. Um, there's so many, you know, someone earlier um, today asked me, what's my favorite essay? And there are just so many essays that I think are so important and worth reading. So I really looked for um, different types of stories and stories that I thought would move different constituencies and different types of voters. Um, I write in the book's introduction that these essays shed light on where the machinery of justice has stopped working and drives us forward to reimagine America's entire system of punishment. Um, I, I really do hope that people engage with these essays and think through what kind of policymakers we should be electing in this country. Because when it comes to criminal justice reform, politics is so important. Right. Um, we have elected judges. We have elected prosecutors. We have elected sheriffs. We have elected state legislators. We have um, elected federal legislators. And um, you know everyone in this room has a chance to vote for policymakers and local officials who believe in investing in our communities, investing in communities we've never invested in, um, not in our prisons and our jails. Right. Thank you. Michael Mendoza, you wrote an essay. I did. All right. Mm -hmm. And in this essay, I'm just going to put a quote a uh, sentence or two. This is what you wrote. In 2011, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that conditions in California's overcrowded prisons violated the Eighth Amendment's ban on cruel and unusual punishment. At that point in time, California's prison system held approximately 156,000 people. It was designed to hold about 85,000. I soon found out for myself how badly overcrowded and violent prisons were at the time, especially for people incarcerated as children, as you were. So, Michael, I have a compound question. Um, first, can you tell us Tell us about that moment when the judge sentenced you, a teenager, to life in prison, 15 to life. How did you, how did you process that moment? I mean, I can't even begin to imagine what that even felt like. And then, once you've talked about that, I'd like you to tell us about one really bad experience you had in prison and one that was an uplifting experience while you were incarcerated. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Um, <clears throat> Michael Mendoza, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you all for, for being here to listen to this discussion. Um, the moment you're asking about was in 1998, two years after my arrest. I was arrested the same year that Ken was in 1996, and this was during the height of the tough on crime. Um, you would hear about this common term called the super predator, 
where a lot of kids, especially black and brown kids, were being called super predators and monsters. And unfortunately, um, at the age of 15, when I did make the worst decision in my life by getting into a car with three other kids who drove into an enemy neighborhood that we considered, we took the life of another young man through gun violence. I found my case for two years, and there I found myself standing before the judge being told that I was going to spend the rest of my life in prison. And it was really hopeless. I felt as if the whole entire world had given up on me. I blamed everyone else but myself. And at that point in time, a life sentence in California practically meant that you were never going to go home. There was a less than 1% chance in that time where you were able to be found suitable and earn your release. And so the message was clear to me then that when a judge told me at the age of 16 that I was being convicted as an adult, that I was going to be sentenced to 15 to life in prison with adults, at that time I just became more angry, more hopeless. At that point in time, everyone else around me, which were adults, were telling me, get used to this. You're not going to go home. This is going to be your life. And so, unfortunately, when the judge gave me that sentence, um, August of 1998, a, a month later, I was transferred to my first adult state prison. And in 1998, in California, they were not separating kids from adults. Um, I was transferred, and this goes to, my, to the second question, I was transferred to a level four security maximum state prison in uh, Blythe, California, Calipatria. It was a level four. And I was transferred to this prison uh, during a, uh, a war, if you will. And so when you ask me what is one of the worst moments in my life in prison, I would have to say that any moment where you're at war with another human being were the worst moments of my life. And I'm talking about you're at physical war because you belong to a, a gang or a race and you have no choice in prison but to align yourself with your race or your gang. Michael, let me interrupt and just ask you for those who cannot actually see you. Um, can you just describe your, your demographics? I mean, you're, you're not a huge person. Go ahead. Yes, uh, um, I'm Mexican-American. Uh, my parents come from Mexico, um, migrated to the United States for a better life. Um, and I was, because of where my crime was committed, the state of California identified me as a Southern gang member. Um, and it was at this prison where, in 1998, I was transferred to Southern Mexicans were in a war with another race. Um, I was 17 years old. This was an adult facility. We were on lockdown, and your alliances would tell you it's on site. Anytime you see one of these individuals, you have to fight. And in your mind, you're starting to tell yourself that in prison, it's ironic to say that you have to run towards destruction for your own safety. Because if you don't, then there are consequences. And so I find myself in the cell with another 17-year-old in a uh, prison, and we were told that you have to learn how to sharpen a knife. Because once your cell door is open, either you're going to protect yourself or you're going to become a victim. And unfortunately, that was just an example of one of the worst times that a human being who was being punished towards rehabilitation experiences. When you are put at odds against other human beings who are just as equally traumatized, angry, afraid, but you're in the situation where you have to survive. And so for me, that was one of the most troubling moments. Um, but I would have to say that my best moment, one of my proudest moments, was when I was finally able to turn my life around and earn an AA degree while I was in prison. Um, thank you. Uh, it was in uh, social and behavioral science. Um, and I mostly did it because uh, I, I believed in education and it gave me a way out. And it helped me think differently. Um, and it, gave me the ultimate opportunity to prepare myself to really earn my freedom. 
And that's, that only happened because the organization that I am still a member of, the Anti-Recidivism Coalition, passed a law that allowed me to prove that I wasn't that 15-year-old kid anymore in 2013. And so really it was because of, of a change in law of, that provided me hope to commit to education, to putting away the, the gang ties, and, and really understanding that something I couldn't understand at such a young age, which was I didn't just participate. I was in the backseat of the car. I wasn't the actual trigger person, but in my heart, I felt that it was okay at that young age, being in a, a gang to take the life of a rival. But what I learned and through maturity as I grew and, and got older, I finally realized that I didn't just take the life of one person. I harmed his family, I harmed his mother, his sister, the high school that he was going to. My dad, who was working at that individual's high school, had to leave. And so I really, my actions caused so much disruption not just in one human being's life, but in so many others that there was no other alternative but to change or continue to, or continue to cause harm to so many people just by being in prison and not changing at all. So my education and earning my way home after policy saved my life was just, it was some of my proudest moments. Oh, thank you. Ken. You are currently the Vice President of Corporate Social Responsibility at Checker and the Executive Director of their Corporate Foundation. Um, and as I said in my intro, people can understand you've had a remarkable journey that led to your current work, which is providing fair chance opportunities to people across the country. So another compound question for you. Okay. Um, Take us to the moment when you were sentenced 52 years to life. Then take us to the moment when you were told by a judge you're no longer incarcerated. You've been back in outside of those walls since 2019. So tell us then about the work that you do with Checker. Sure. Um, I'll try to keep it relatively mm. brief. So. As Michael mentioned, um, I was first arrested in 1995 and 1996 um, at the height of the three strikes law in California, which set, set wildfires of new laws across the country um, to get tough on crime, to use Michael's words. Um, Pete Wilson was governor. They basically, in LA County, were striking out every single person that did anything, right? Whether it was a misdemeanor, felony, wobbler, whatever you describe, people were getting life sentences for stealing a pack of cigarettes in, in LA County. And I just happened to be a passenger in a stolen vehicle, which first take accountability was definitely wrong. Um, but to give people kind of an idea to talk about joyriding, this is the judge's word. He said, this is really joyriding. That usually carries a 30 day right. slap on the wrist, sometimes weekend probation type situation. So, you know, the judge really didn't feel like I deserve life. And he, he told me in a, in a five minute conversation that I could take a deal for 14 years, which Romero had just passed, um, or get life in prison. And, and for Romero, people understand this, this was a case that came out of the California Supreme Court that permitted judges in California to, under very narrow circumstances, maybe dismiss a strike. Right. Okay. Right. So the, so the judge, in essence, told me that my case wasn't worth a life sentence. And... He said, I'm gonna give you five minutes to make a decision. And this was the day of trial. And so for me, I was in my mid twenties and I had three young, small children. The prospect of serving 14 years seemed alarming to me. Um, you know, I was calculating now I'd be 40 years old. I was like, oh, that's kind of old. Um, and so, so I, I told him I like to get overnight to think about it. And I'd like to be able to call my family members and, and have some discussion and get some counsel. And I'll come back tomorrow and, and let them know what my decision was. And he basically told me that I didn't have that freedom. And he said that if you don't make the decision now, he said, I'm sharing with you today. And this is a quote. He said, I'm not telling you, you don't have a constitutional right to trial, but today I'm offering you this. And tomorrow, if you don't do this, it's going to be this. And that's what he said. It's on the record. Um, so I just told him that I wasn't ready to make the decision in five minutes because I felt just a tremendous amount of pressure in that moment. 
Um, I came back, it was a Friday, I came back on Monday and told him, okay, I'm ready to do it. And he said, well, that's off the table, but I'll let you make an open plea. And so I did, and he gave me 52 years of life. So the plea deal went off the table because yes. you opted to just wait over the weekend. Yes. You come back in and the judge says, okay, so here yes. it is, you wanna plead, yeah. plead. And then gave you the 52 to He life. gave me 52 years of life. So what was going through your head at that moment? <laughs> I mean, to be perfectly honest with you, I did not believe that I would serve life in prison for being a passenger soldier. Like, it, it didn't dawn on me. So I was numb to the process in the moment. Um, and I was probably numb for the first 10 years. Um, Prop 66 almost passed the first time in, in uh, 2000 or 2004, I believe. And so I thought that there was hope at some point, but as each year went by, I started to lose hope. And then about halfway through my sentence, you know, I became an avid reader, and that was part of the way that I would keep myself educated. I had a book by the Black Panther Party, which was a legal book. It was a legitimate uh, acquired book in prison, in, unless you were black. Um, and they found the book, and they told me that I would be given an indeterminate shoe program because they thought that I was becoming overly politicized with the reading material I had in my, in my um, so, and for people who cannot see you, you are African American. I'm African American, and I, you know, I, but I had a wide variety of books. I had, you know, Tolstoy, Walden, you name it. I mean, I just had a wide variety of, of literature um, at any given time. And so, books about the Black Panther Party or that lean left tended to, I would learn, scare prison officials because they thought that maybe you might become politicized. And so, in 1990, I mean, 2007, they gave me an indeterminate sentence in solitary confinement. So we're talking about excessive punishment, so I'm the poster child for this, right? Um, so they told me that I, would, I, I was too dangerous for any California prison general population, and that I had to be neutralized in solitary confinement, in essence, forever, until my sentence was up. And at that time, um, following on what Michael said, the only way that you could get out of solitary confinement is what they said, snitch, parole, or die. That was a well-known quote in California from the CDCR. And uh, in 2016, three strikes law was overturned. I was in solitary confinement, 2012 actually, I was in solitary confinement. And I said, okay, well, I'm gonna be home in 90 days. Like, uh, I'll, I'm going home. And the district attorney in LA County said that because I was in solitary confinement that they would oppose me being released. So I actually fought that for seven years after that. I did a whole nother prison sentence. Um, and with the help of Stanford University, Mike Romano, who, who we all know and love um, in, the, in the Three Strikes Project, and then Mayor Brown, a corporate law firm, came in and helped execute my civil rights lawsuit that I filed against the state for doing that to me. Just under the First Amendment and all the rest of that, um, I was released in 2019 um, as a result. Well, tell us about Checker. Yeah, so my, my, my path to Checker and my role now is not a trajectory I would advise for most people to take because uh, it, it does involve 24 years in prison. Um, when I came home, one of the conditions of my release was to come to the Bay Area in California. I'm a native of LA. And I went to work for a public interest law firm shortly after I got out, um, LSPC over in Oakland, um, and became a paralegal. And then shortly thereafter, uh, my executive director called me in the office and he said, Ken, we knew that you could write legal briefs, but we didn't know you could talk. So, so we're going to send you to Sacramento to be a state policy director and advocate for criminal justice reform. Now, I didn't know anything about policy, but I knew how to, you know, speak up. I had a little lawyer in me. Um, so I did that and just built some amazing relationships. This is where I met um, the, the amazing um, Michael Mendoza um, and Elizabeth Calvin and all the other um, great advocates in California and, and criminal justice reform organizations and really cut my teeth on what it was like to be an advocate and, and learn policy. And then took that experience and became executive director of a upstart nonprofit in 2020 um, and said that I was gonna build the Stanford of reentry programs for California because I thought the reentry system in the United States was abysmal and mirrored the prison system. And so I set out to design a reentry program that looked like the first year of college rather than the first year of prison, where it would be a campus with living, dignified living with your own room and your own bathroom, digital literacy training, financial literacy training, full wraparound services, job placement and a livable wage career, and then livable wage housing. And I took that show on the road to the Governor Newsom's office and leveraged my policy relationships with the legislature. And in 2021, somebody believed me because they wrote me in the budget for $28.5 million to build it out. Good Lord. 
um, two years out of prison. Wow. And shortly thereafter, Checker came and knocked on my door and said they were interested in building out an ecosystem for corporate social responsibility and a corporate foundation and advocate for fair chances for justice impacted men and women across the country to access livable wage employment and economic mobility. And to their credit, as, as, a, as a tech company, a young tech company, they wanted somebody that was a proximate leader who had proximity to the issues. And um, you know, I told them at first, no, I'm not interested because I just got $30 million from Governor Newsom. But they kept persisting and convinced me in the latter part of 2021 to join their team as an executive. Um, and I've been there ever since, talking to some of the biggest companies in America about opening their doors and pa creating pathways for justice-impacted men and women to access work. Because I, I personally believe that livable wage is the great equalizer in recidivism. I've, I've been around some of the toughest people in America in prison. And I can tell you, people with tattoos on their faces, people that have committed heinous crimes, when you give them a $75,000 a year job, they become coaches of their son's baseball team, they're model citizens, they're in the house because they now have a stake in the game. They have dignity, and they have something that they never had before, which is access to life. So that's Where, where's Checker based? Checker's here in San Francisco, right down the street on uh, Montgomery. Fantastic. I told y'all we had remarkable people up here on this panel. So we go to our fourth remarkable person. All right. And um, Kevin, yes. the last mile is in 16 facilities, as we saw across seven states. Um, so can you talk to us about, a, we saw the success story of Billy. And I know, I think we'd all like to hear another one, um, but have the successes of the last mile inspired more organizations or more, more importantly, more correctional departments? I, I, I hesitate to use that name, correction, all yeah. this, what gets corrected here. Um, but have you encouraged the, you know, those that run the prisons to support second chance opportunities for people behind bars? Definitely. I mean, we, as you mentioned, are, are currently in seven states. We just signed agreements with Pennsylvania and New York as well. And we're going into one of the most notorious prisons in the country, Sing Sing. So we, we have been able to build out a program that's not only been successful inside, but also when people return. And I think that's one of the key differentiators is that we encourage our students to not just learn the technical skills in the classroom around technology, audio video production, and then also we have a reentry and professional development course. What we're starting to see from some corrections departments in states is, and it's, I wanna say this very clearly, this is not a red and blue issue. This is a human rights issue in the United States. This is a, this is a civil rights disaster in the United States, as far as I'm concerned. So what, we're be, what we've been able to do with the last mile is not only build out a truly unique program in that we actually have our own cloud-based system inside prisons that's completely protected and completely secure. We've never had a breach of our system. So when Correction sees what we're doing, it's not just that we're training people, it's innovative, it's relevant to the job market, and we're, we're willing to continue to change and grow. So we're gonna start offering different courses over the next couple of years that are more relevant to the current job market. We're also connecting with organizations outside to make sure that we have jobs when people come home. Our current uh, employment status too for the last mile itself is 54% of our employees are justice impacted. So we're not just saying, let's do this, we're actually doing it. So when Corrections sees this happening, and there are a lot more innovative people in corrections now than ever before. Hmm. I think California is a great example. And both Chris Redlitz, our founder, and myself have been fortunate enough to be on the committee working with San Quentin to create the change right. um, and create this California model. So, you know, we're looked at as innovators in the space. And then we're partnering with organizations like Checker, with the Brennan Center, you know, with, with ARC to do other programs. And in fact, Scott, one of the one of the founders is gonna meet us in, down in Lancaster next month. So part of it is that we're not playing the ego game either. We wanna include everybody so that we can get the best outcomes. Mm -hmm. But Ken, let me just ask you a quick question. Um, we've heard briefly the background of Michael, of Kevin, <laughs> Ken. And of, of Ken, yeah. get these Ken and Kevins. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, and LB, what, what's your story? Okay, so uh, 25 years ago, 
I was arrested for the last time in San Francisco and I was living on the streets, a heroin addict. Um, and I had gotten there through years of, of substance and alcohol use. Um, I was fortunate enough to get an offer that was either go spend my time in the CDCR, starting with five years. Do people know what CDCR is? California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. Um, <laughs> and, um, or spend my time in a long-term treatment facility. At that time, we had treatment on demand in San Francisco uh, due to the DA Terrence Hallinan instituting that policy. Um, so I got the opportunity to spend two years in a residential program rather than go to to the state penitentiary. Is that like a Delancey Street? or It was Walden House at the time. Okay. Yeah, so behavior modification, mm -hmm. um, you know, therapeutic community, very different than most of the modalities today in recovery, but it worked for me. Um, so, <coughs> and I, I really took the opportunity and never looked back. So my, my entire life since then has been service to others, you know, and that's, you know, that's, as Muhammad Ali says, the rent we pay for our room here on earth. That's right. Mm. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. So a comment, if you could answer, uh, you know, a question about the video. Yes. Um, it's wonderful. How did you choose Billy? And can you just give us a little information about the video? Yeah, this one's, I, I, you know, honestly, I've watched that. That's the sixth time I've seen that video That's and right, I've cried yeah. every time. It's wonderful. So um, Billy is, I, I'm very close with Billy. She is, um, you know, I mean, she gave up a year of her life to complete the last mile program. So um, we have many, many other success stories, but Billy came about because the Pacers really wanted to hire a graduate from our program. We had been talking with them a long time, and I will say this, especially about them, is they are, are really an example of how it can be done right. Um, and I think they should be an example for the rest of the NBA. Absolutely. You know, and I'm wondering why the Warriors haven't hired anybody. So, you know, well, we need Warriors. to make that happen. We need to make that happen. You know, absolutely. Hint, hint, Warriors, if you're watching. Yeah. Um, but we've got a pathway to do this. Absolutely. And, we, and, and the, the job that she has is available in every single NBA team across the country. That position is available. So, hint, hint, also to our other yes, states. Absolutely. <laughs> Oklahoma. That's right. You know. Fantastic. Montana doesn't have an NBA team, but we can place somebody, so wow. they'd like us to. This is great. Uh, but so we went to our, our advocates, our um, return citizen advocates, and asked them for recommendations for this job in Indiana. It's an in-person job. And so we had a pool of like five or six, and um, unfortunately, some of them didn't qualify because parole, again, the rules that you have to comply to when you get out, would not allow people to move to Indiana or to Indianapolis for the job. Just because? Just because, you know, somebody gets a feeling about something and decides that they're gonna control somebody else's life. Yeah. You know, as it happens a lot with parole. And I, I will say, just as a side note, and I won't get too far into this, post-release supervision is a travesty. Mm -hmm. It is utterly obscene. So, um, Billy lived in Indiana, actually, or Indianapolis. She was actually a lifelong Pacers fan. At one point had season tickets. She's got a bunch of sons, I think six sons, and they're all Pacers fans. Um, and she did, I mean, she rehearsed for her interview every single day before the interview. She was ready for the job. It was down between her and one other candidate and they chose her and you saw her reaction. Yeah. I mean, this wasn't just a win for, for, for Billy. This is a win for her family. This is a win for the last mile and really a win for the community. And I think one thing that hasn't been touched on is the billions of dollars in waste mm -hmm. because of, we're missing people from our communities. And I'm not just talking about tax dollars. I'm talking about when we get people sustainable employment, what they're putting back into their communities. You know, the, the uncles, the brothers, the fathers, the mothers, the sons, the daughters that are missing, missing from our community. They've been removed. And a lot of times moved to places where they can't be visited. So when we, we talk about excessive punishment, we're not even talking about just the fact that people are in prison a long time. They're literally removed from their communities. A lot of them forever. Yeah. You, know, you know, like Michael, one of my best friends was imprisoned at 17 and was never gonna get out. And so I've watched his journey after he's come home. And it's incredible. It's incredible. And if you give someone a chance and treat them like a human being, the things that they can do are, there's no ceiling, in my opinion. And when you faced adversity, especially if you faced adversity, like these gentlemen have, you know, and I can say for myself living on the streets that I have, when you get that opportunity, I'm grateful to the guy that hired me for my first job, and I will be till the, till the end of my life. Right. We're still friends. And that's almost 25 years of friendship. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Well, 
Um, so LB, um, are any, because I went through the list of contributors, mm -hmm. are any of them judges? No, I don't think any are. Okay, so. We did have the judge write about the book. Um, right, I saw the blurb on the back. Yep. But, but here, here's what Next I- Next edition. Well, <laughs> I'm coming a, to you first, okay? <laughs> well, here, here's why I raise it though, um, that it's trial court judges. Mm -hmm. They're the ones, it used to be me, who order the incarceration of hundreds of thousands of human beings. Mm -hmm. And when I heard Ken, Kevin. Ken, Ken. That's Ken. what I thought. It's okay, we look Ken. fine. Ken, right. So when I heard Ken talk about what that judge said to you and how he treated you, I, you know, I, I just wondered that maybe that was the reason why there were no judges as contributors here because, I mean, People don't enter those doors unless there is someone in a black robe who says, that's where you're going, right? Um, so any of you, I, I throw this out to everybody, I mean, I just toss it out about your feelings about judges. I mean, judges are elected. They don't know what's going on behind bars. Most don't. There are some maybe that have taken some time um, to kind of look at that. But I'd be curious about your comments on that, and then I'll throw another question out. And of course, I'm waiting for questions from the audience, too. Go ahead. I'd love to chime in just, just because I had a special relationship with this judge. It was a, a really a hate relationship, no love relationship. <laughs> but, uh, you know, in fairness to judges who are trying to do a job, it's, it's really a systemic issue when we talk about the investment in punishment versus the investment in people. And America in general has done a very good job at demonizing and othering people in general. When it comes to retribution, specifically, when you look at the reasons we went to wars, the way that we look at the way we punish crime, like we're overly excessive, just in general as a society. And that stems from leadership to the political infrastructure, the social fabric, et cetera. So I think in many cases, judges are continuations or, or one body on the continuum of that practice. Um, and it's really a practice that we need to get away from because it doesn't have a great ROI. Hmm. Right, and in my experience, when you, in, and this, let me pause, because first I wanna give a shout out and condolences to any single person that's ever been the victim of any kind of crime. I, I, I never wanna miss that part, because when we talk about criminal justice reform, it doesn't negate that part of the conversation. But there is a consequence that happens, a human capital consequence, when we don't invest in people. And the purpose of a, of a criminal justice system should be transformation. We want citizens that are healthy citizens. We want people who are contributors to society. And, and what I think we don't do enough of is understand that the people that are going through the criminal justice system are actually a reflection of ourselves, mm -hmm. right, in the greater society. And so when we take a little bit more accountability systemically, and we say, okay, hey, this person has some challenges going in. They did something that we don't like. How can we invest to make sure that this doesn't happen again rather than just like give somebody 700 years when the average life expectancy is 80, right? When we just wanna pile it on and pile it on and pile it on and pile it on. I think that's where the harm and the damage comes in, not only to the people who have to serve the time, but also to the people who are giving out the time. So I, you know, I give my judge grace, like he was caught up in the fervor of the political firestorm of what was California in 1995 doesn't excuse it, um, but yeah, it, it, you know I, I give him grace. Well, go ahead. You're building on what Ken just said, there's a great essay in the book on the trial penalty. Yes, which is really what happened to you. That is what happened to me. Um, and it's, you know, th this is how excessive we are as a country. A prosecutor can say, okay, if you take a plea deal today. Um, we'll offer you six months, but if you go to trial, yeah, 10, 20, 30, and people have to decide on the spot or within a day, and you know, th that is the most punitive possible way we could treat people. And you know, um, NACDL, National Assistant of Criminal Defense Lawyers, and, and the ABA, and you know, a lot of groups right now are working to try to end the trial penalty across the country. 
but it happens in every courtroom, in every prosecutor's office. Um, you know, you're, you're, you know, everyone here is very aware of it. I do think um, a lot of people in this country just have no idea that that's how justice works in the United States. Yeah, it, it's I don't, I don't completely call it arbitrary. It's not justice. It's, at it's all. not justice. Right. Um, but it it really goes to the excessive punishment and the lack of humanity and the lack of proportionality, the lack of fairness. And it is, it's a human rights violation Absolutely. that we're treating people like this. So it's interesting though, because the Sixth Amendment to the United States Constitution guarantees every single person a right to a speedy jury trial. And yet, when you request it, it's yeah. treated as, a, you know, ooh, this is bad, you're messing up the system, That's take right. a plea bargain, 98% mm -hmm. of criminal cases in America are resolved through plea bargains. And uh, so this trial penalty, and it isn't just prosecutors, it is judges, because I've yeah. heard them say to defendants, if you don't take this deal, That's right. if you go to trial, I'm throwing the book at you. That's a right. penalty for exercising a right under the Sixth right. Amendment. So this is a big deal, and it is part of the excessive punishment. I'm gonna go to a couple of questions from the audience, but before I do that, I have one more that I wanna throw out to all of you. Um, it seems to me, that the clarion call for a reform of our criminal legal system is, has really slowed to a crawl. And here's why I say this. Progressive district attorneys across the country are being targeted in recall elections, and they're being challenged when their terms are up. A quick example, San Francisco, Progressive DA was recalled after just a short time in office, replaced by a DA who has repeatedly and publicly denounced judges for being too lenient. In Cook County, Illinois, a DA, Progressive, has opted not to run for re-election. Re the two people running for that seat, one is a retired judge, a Democrat, the other is a Republican attorney, both of whom are doing the tough on crime law and order dance to get elected. In Oakland, California, a DA, progressive DA is being targeted for a recall allegedly because she doesn't care enough about victims of crimes and because she's too allegedly lenient in charging individuals. In Los Angeles, the DA has survived two recall challenges and is now facing a very serious reelection campaign. In Philadelphia, the progressive DA is constantly fighting off recalls and election challenges. So my question, if the voters and I put that in quote, if the voters want prosecutors who are tougher and want more punishment, what is to be done? Is the message against excessive punishment somehow getting lost? I, I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab, just a quick stab. I, I think history is the best teller of the future. And if you look at what we did with the three strikes law in California, like it was right after Polly Class had got murdered in 1993. A, a heinous, terrible crime from a guy that got out of San Quentin for a second degree murder. And there was just this huge reactionary fervor, not only in California, but across the country. And so we said, okay, we're gonna lock every single person up that does anything. And we did that, we did that for about 20 years. And then we realized that we actually can't afford this. We're spending a million dollars to give a person a sentence. And when you do that by the thousands and tens of thousands, all of a sudden you're bankrupt in your government. And that's what happened in California. And so then those very same voters who wanted to pass, lock them up and throw away the key forever, were then begging the state of California to recall. Conservatives and liberals. Yeah, conservatives and liberals to reverse it. And so this reactionary policies that people are calling out for, they have to recognize there's a cost for this. And, and most of the time, people aren't willing to pay the cost when they realize how big the cost is. And it's actually a better investment when you invest in people. The stuff that's happening now with, with crime is not a result of lenient sentences, right? It's, it's, it's a lot, we, coming off COVID, two and a half years, people lost a tremendous amount of jobs. Prop 47 is not the culprit of why people are breaking into stores in San Francisco. People are breaking into stores in San Francisco because of poverty. Mm -hmm. And when you can solve some of the basic fundamental poverty issues that are existing, then all of that stuff is going to start to go away, at least the economic crime stuff. Okay. Anybody else want to jump in? Well, I think the, that it is getting lost. And I think the messaging from... Is this Kevin? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is right. From, this, from people that, that want change, is not, it's getting lost completely because we still are living in this um, news cycle that's really dramatic, 
You know, it's like panic time if anything happens, but we don't ever get to talk about the wins. We get, get to talk about what people are doing to change their lives. Was that a media problem, though? The media loves well, to run with the it's, you know, a, the... it's a media problem. It's also, you know, we live in an incredibly fearful society as well. I mean, so people kind of grab onto that, right? But there, I mean, there is, there is crime. There is violent crime. But the way that we're treating it in punishment and as well as how we're treating our children in lower income areas especially is... is part of the key factor to all of this. And so what are we really doing to solve this problem? Obviously, after the 80s and 90s, locking everybody up and throwing away the key did not work. We didn't, you know, we didn't see dramatic um, decreases in crime because of punishment. And a lot of the crime, the, the decreases in crime and the decreases in recidivism come at times when we're letting people out that have that we should already know have aged out of any of that behavior to begin with. Yeah, but let, let me just throw in, after 2020 and the murder of George Floyd and, right. and others, the pendulum swung and it everybody's did. yelling, criminal legal reform, reform, reform. But it feels like the pendulum is now swinging back the other way to the extreme. Well, in 2020, crime increased um, across the country, and it, it happened in red cities, blue cities, cities with progressive prosecutors, cities with what are considered more traditional prosecutors. But the facts don't matter, because if you're considered, if you're labeled a progressive prosecutor, and there's any crime in your city, people are gonna try to recall you, say that your policies are creating the crime problems. And in fact, since 2020, crime has significantly receded in this country. And to your point, 2020 was the beginning of the pandemic. Um, after school programs were shut down, anti-violence programs were shut down, economic un insecurity was significant, people were losing their jobs. Um, there was you know, more availability of guns at the same time as well. But we've seen tremendous reduction in, in crime rates over the last couple of years, but, but the public you know, hasn't caught up to that. The public doesn't seem to believe it. Um, you know, Gallup has been polling people about crime for decades, and people always say crime is high. Crime is, you know, yeah. they always think crime is higher than it actually is. And that's just the culture we live in. Um, social media, everything is just yeah. picking it up. Mm -hmm. I have Robert, a question. Yeah, Michael. If I, if I may, <clears throat> just to add on, I think you said something that stood out to me, which is people yelling at each other. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we've done in politics. We all care about public safety. And at least in California in the last 10 years, like I came home in 2014, criminal justice wasn't popular then. Mm -hmm. We had barely, we haven't even changed laws then. And when we started to see an influx of people impacted by a situation, using their stories, people who committed crimes, survivors of violent crimes, we started to be able to change this narrative and change laws to the point where a lot of people were saying, wait, you're going too far, you're going too fast. And they started blaming a lot of these criminal justice reforms uh, for the rise in crime when there was no data behind it. And now we're even more polarized in this country more than ever before. And it's just on the fact that we can't even have a simple conversation on what we can agree on to move forward. Yeah, it's huge. I have a question from the audience, a quick one for Kevin. <laughs> In the short documentary, why did you decide to feature a white woman considering that so many black people are incarcerated? That's a very good question. I, it wasn't actually a choice of a white woman. It was a choice of the position at the Pacers. So the, the company that offered to do the documentary for free was going to follow whoever got that job. So it had nothing to do with race or uh, demographic and any, anything other than they got the job at the Pacers. Got it. It's another question. What can I do as a new attorney to play a part in prison reform? I currently work at the Public Defender's Office in Sacramento. Full disclosure, I'm still a law student. Graduate next May. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say get past that bar, yeah. first and foremost. Yeah. All right. I mean, you, we need you in there. And then? And then? obviously defend your, your clients to the best of your ability, but I think one of the things that I was, I've always been interested in and was brought up in, in this discussion is, what if everybody went on strike and, and decided to go for a trial? 
What if we got a movement going? The system would implode. You yeah, know that. Yeah. and it, it would should, implode. quite honestly, because they, we force people into an unconstitutional system. We're forcing them to take plea deals that are bad. And I watched it happen over and over again in the bullpen when I took my deal. My deal was pretty good. Two years versus five. It made sense, right? What they didn't tell me until I reread that plea agreement that I signed was that if I did not complete the program that I was going to totally and graduate, I had to give up all that time and go do my full five years in prison. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So when I became a prosecutor, I remember asking my colleagues and everyone in the office, I don't understand why, why, why does this exist? Why are we offering something now, but then people go to trial and we can't guarantee them the same deal? And the answer is, to your point, right, the system can't handle it. There are not enough judges. There are not enough attorneys, public defenders. There are not enough prosecutors. There's too many cases. And so what we've built in this country is truly a system of mass incarceration that is so big, so expensive, that the courts cannot handle the number of trials that we should be having in this country. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's a devastating system. Yeah. yeah. I'd like to just add one thing to, sure. the, to the young woman who said she was working for the public defender's office. N never let anyone steal, especially a public defender's office, her fervor to fight and want to mm -hmm. see justice. I, 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 my sister graduated from Spelman and, and went to law school and became a public defender. And a lot of times students come out and they, they want to serve the community, they want to be purpose-driven leaders. They go into these offices with wide eyes and they think that they can change the world. Understand that it's more important to have open eyes than wide eyes at the public defender's office because you're going to be under-resourced. You're going to have a thousand more caseload than everybody right. else. And, and, and don't let that damper your fervor to, right. to want to yeah, be a defender. And, and my advice to that law student is um, 10 years after you graduate, you'll be eligible to be a judge. And so think right. about the change that you could make wearing a black robe mm. That's on right. the bench. Um, our time is about up, and uh, I have one question for each of you, and you're going to have like 30 seconds to answer this. Um, if you had the ability, the absolute ability to change one thing about the criminal legal system, what would it be? Anybody want to start? 30 seconds. Just one thing. You could wake a wand, have a magic wand, and make it happen. I just start on this end. Pardon, um, go ahead. I mean, this is this is Michael. Go ahead. It's hard just picking one thing because the system's so complex. Um, but I would obviously, <clears throat> I would obviously change extreme sentencing laws, and the amount of time a human being is isolated or separated from the community in order to be held accountable. Okay. Thank you. I, I deconstruct it and change it from a punitive model to a transformational mm -hmm. model. I deconstruct the whole thing and not base it on punishment. It would be based on transformation, shorter sentences, more focused on transforming the individual and sending back a whole person back into society to contribute. Right. So you said I have a magic wand, so yep, I'm gonna, I'm gonna right. use that. Um, right. And I would shrink the criminal legal system Significantly, um, you know, the Brennan Center had a report a couple of years ago where we found just looking at public safety, you know, number of people in state and federal prison not even looking at jails, 40% of those people were there for no good public safety reason. Either they should never have gone there or they were there for far too long. We need a system that is so much smaller and we should be investing in that system. So we should be providing programming. We should be working with groups like the Last Mile, Check or connecting people with jobs and resources. And if we had a much smaller system, we could actually invest in those people. That's right. Okay. All of them, all of, all of the above. And I'd like to see, um, you know, from the start when someone's arrested that money be taken out of it, whether it be cash bail or having to afford an, a lawyer that could actually defend you because they're not overwhelmed with caseload so that we even the playing field for everybody well, and we have a true justice system. My first step in all of this is to require everyone working within the prison system, within any part of the legal, criminal legal system, to read excessive punishment. <laughs> first step. <laughs> all 
Our Great thanks answer. to our audience uh, for all of your questions. I wish we had time to answer them all. And our thanks to L.B. Eisen, Senior Director of the Justice Program at the Brennan Center for Justice and editor of Excessive Punishment, How the Justice System Creates Mass Incarceration. Kevin McCracken, the Executive Director, Officer at the Last Mile. Michael Mendoza, former Director of Advocacy at the Anti-Recidivism Coalition. And Ken Oliver, Executive Director of the Checker Foundation. So we encourage you to purchase excessive punishment here or at your local bookstore. And if you would like to support the Commonwealth Clubs and World Affairs efforts in making virtual and in-person programming possible, please visit the website www.commonwealthclub.org. I'm Ladaris Cordell. Thank you and onward.